Good afternoon, and thank you to the ESCS committee for their invitation. This talk may be a bit different, as we will discuss the environmental impact of computational biology. It sounds like an ideal time to do it, with all the new methods presented this week. Unfortunately, there are loads of examples of the consequences of climate change. But this project started following the terrible Australian bushfires last January. The pictures are striking, and as biologists, we can't ignore the health burden of these events. It made us realize that we had to do more to address the carbon impact of our work. More and more large-scale computations are done in data centers, either local institutional servers or cloud facilities. So the first question is whether data centers have a significant impact on climate change. Well, to no one's surprise, they do. We could pull a lot of different numbers, but there's one that I find particularly striking. Data centers all over the world emit 100 megatons of CO2 every year. This is as much as the entire American commercial aviation. Of course, a lot of this is not related to biology or even computational research. But, but as a data scientist spending a lot of time training machine learning algorithms, I can't help but think that we need to take a closer look at our own impact. Especially as so many modern breakthroughs have been enabled by supercomputers and algorithms. To measure this, it's interesting to look at the most cited scientific papers of all time. The large representation of bioinformatic tools shows how widely used complex algorithms are in this field. Of course, it's not only biology. Physics also relies heavily on computations, for example. But if citation count correlates, even remotely, with usage and carbon impact, we are looking at thousands of tons of CO2 released in the atmosphere as a result of research projects. Of course, I'm not saying that it wasn't worth it, far from it, but simply that, unlike the financial cost of a project, its carbon cost should be acknowledged and taken into account. We worked on this with Jason Greeley, a PhD student at the Baker Institute, and Mike Inouye. And we quickly realized that, despite some initial work on deep learning, this entire aspect of computational research has been ignored so far. So we began with a blog article on the HDR UK website to raise awareness. In today's data-driven world, a problem doesn't exist until we can collect data about it. So that's where we started. Our solution uh, for that comes as an open source online calculator. But before talking about it in more details, let's briefly cover the how. How to estimate the carbon impact of a particular algorithm. I'm constrained by time today, but if you're interested and want more details, feel free to check out our preprint on archive. So first, we need metrics to quantify the impact. Most emissions are a mix of greenhouse gases, like methane or carbon dioxide. So we'd like a single unit measuring the global warming impact. Fortunately, there is one, called carbon dioxide equivalent. Besides, these numbers need some context. So we created a new unit to answer the question, how long would it take a tree to absorb these emissions? We called it tree month. It obviously depends on a lot of parameters, but it's been estimated that a mature tree sequesters around 11.4 kilograms of CO2 per year, which conveniently means that a tree month is equal to just under a kilogram of CO2 equivalent. Other reference values can include driving. Uh, 175 is the average uh, for a European car. For instance, American cars are around 251 grams. Um, the emissions of planes and rail travel change a lot between domestic and international lines. We usually don't think about it, but a search on Google has a carbon footprint, and so does a streaming Netflix. All right, so to estimate the carbon footprint of a model, we need two distinct components. First, how much energy is drawn by the computer to run the entire model. This only depends on the efficiency of the hardware and the algorithm itself. And second, how is this energy produced? 
which mainly depends on the geographic location of, of the servers uh, and the energy mix of the country. The formula for the first component is rel relatively straightforward. It depends on how long the algorithm needs to run for and how much power is drawn during that time. Power can be drawn by many different components, but we have estimated that the total power need is mainly due to the processing cores, usually CPUs or GPUs, and the memory. And finally, uh, the efficiency of the data center plays a, an important part. The power usage efficiency takes into account the extra power needed um, mainly to cool down the computers. The impact of producing such energy is called carbon intensity. It varies greatly between countries, and if you're working on the cloud and have some flexibility about where you can run your models, this is the best way for you to reduce your emissions. For example, running the same tool in Australia compared to Norway will emit a baffling 81 times more carbon dioxide, a good reason to push for greener energies. So this is a list of all the countries uh, with known carbon intensity um, and available in the app already. If you want to look up the real-time carbon intensity of a country, Electricity Map is a useful tool, even though they don't cover all, um, all countries. All right, so we now uh, know how to estimate the carbon footprint in theory, but that still sounds complicated in practice. What we need is a simple tool, reliable and accessible to every scientist. And because we couldn't find one, we created the Green Algorithms Calculator. You can simply input some basic information about your model and your hardware, and it tells you the associated carbon impact and energy consumption, as well as the equivalence in terms of tree months, driving and flying. You can also see the split between processors and memory and compare your country to other locations. By the way, uh, I talk a lot about data centers today, but of course you can also use this tool for analysis that you run directly on your computer or laptop. Um, there's a dedicated option on the app for that. You can also find a comparison of locations and processes and some definitions and tips on what you can do to limit your own impact. And finally, uh, some more details about the methods and a text you can copy and paste in your manuscript to report it. And it even works on phones and tablets. In summary, the app is quite easy to use, available online, so no download necessary, and completely free and open source for more transparency. All the code and data is available on GitHub. So once we had a suitable tool, we could finally get back to our first goal, and we started looking at the carbon footprint of bioinformatics and genomics. The full results are not out yet, but a preprint should be released in the coming weeks, led by Jason, with great support from several members of the lab. We wanted to have an overview uh, of the carbon impact of the most common tasks in computational biology from genome assembly and read alignments to protein docking and molecular dynamic simulations. If we zoom out, we can also fit GWAS in the frame. So to estimate these emissions, uh, we used mainly published benchmarks, and when we couldn't find any, we used in-house analysis. We tried to imagine common use cases and sensible scales for the analysis. For example, for GWAS, we looked at two versions of Bolt LMM to analyze 100 traits with UK Biobank. This shows that by updating to the last version, over 1200 kilograms of CO2 can be saved. If I go quickly over the other results, uh, for protein docking, these results correspond to 1 million ligands tested. EQTL mapping here is a comparison between two pipelines, Limix that uses CPUs and TensorQTL that uses GPUs. Here, the extra power consumption of a GPU is largely offset by the accelerated computations. Metaspades, MetaVelvet, and MegaHit uh, were compared for the metagenome assembly of 100 salt samples. Molecular dynamic simulations tools uh, were compared on the satellite tobacco mosaic virus. We based our evaluation of a classic RNA-seq QC pipeline on just over 
just under 400 samples and tools like FastQC and Star. Megate again uh, and Ab Abyss were compared for de novo human genome assembly. And finally, we looked at read alignment for human and malaria genome using STAR, both emitting a negligible amount of CO2. Of course, other criteria are taken into account when choosing the best tool for an analysis, but the carbon impact of a method should be one of these criteria. Besides, these numbers are only for one run, but often a project will consist of multiple runs, either to debug or to optimize some parameters. In machine learning, for example, hundreds or even thousands of iterations are sometimes necessary. We formalized this through a pragmatic scaling factor. I won't have time to talk more about this today, uh, but you can find more info in the preprint. For the results presented today, uh, the orders of magnitude are more important than the exact values especially since each analysis is a bit different. Using published benchmarks, as we did, is not the most accurate way to measure carbon emissions. The best way to do it is for you to do it directly on your own analysis. For example, the team behind the new Regeny GWAS algorithm did so. And apparently, even Twitter thought the carbon impact was too shocking to be displayed. They showed a reduction in emissions of 87% compared to SAGE. So if there is only one thing to remember from this talk, it's that you can all lead the way in your respective fields by being transparent about the carbon footprint of your work. But if you want to remember a few other things, here's what you can do in practice. Um, optimize or use optimized uh, tools to reduce running time or peak memory usage. Limit the number of runs to a minimum by debugging on a smaller scale uh, and keeping parameters optimization to a reasonable level. If you can, carefully choose the geographic location of your data center. You can also uh, offset your carbon emissions by supporting green projects. And as we mentioned before, be transparent about your footprint. To conclude, I'd like to thank all our collaborators who helped us along the way, both in Cambridge and Melbourne, as well as the different funding bodies. And if you have any questions, suggestions on how to improve the tool, want a hand to estimate your emissions, or would just like would like some new features, uh, feel free to reach out at these addresses. Um, and I post regular updates about new releases on Twitter alongside short summaries of what we discussed today. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to taking your questions.